it's not happening independent of our own government and in my opinion, really ridiculously oppressive decisions being made by this surprise, <laughs> just put them on the list. And also to lift up, um, and I think having just been in Mexico, his comment about animals like hit me in, in a different visceral cellular way of like, who's behaving like an animal? Who is separating parents from children? Who is, you know, unremittingly like not behaving as a moral human being? It would not be the people I just spent a month with who are loving, kind, I, you know, all of the State Department warnings I, I felt as safe there as I do in any big city. You know, you, you don't do stupid stuff, but you know, just I just the the reversals that we get of who's to blame for stuff over and over, who's violent. We just get I, I just, you know, look <laughs> look look for the opposite of what you're being told about who's invading whom and who's is behaving. So I, I just wanted to lift that up because that one would always be horrible and and evil, really, but but this week I felt it more, you know, Elizabeth Wynn said some people feel things as news and some people as family. And this, this week having just spent a month specifically in Mexico, although he obviously was talking about anybody, any black and brown immigrants, I'm sure from any country, but um, it just, that one particularly um, hurt in a different way. And that's why I'm glad I went to Mexico. So um, oh, let's make it about me. I, okay, another day of that. Okay, little white centering there. Apologies, I'm learning. So what else is going on where you are, Christina or Michael? Well, what's going on here? Um, that's, that's a great question. <laughs> Do you have hurricanes or something out your way or tornadoes? We, we, we had tornadoes um well tuesday it was uh this line of thunderstorms that came through the the whole eastern united states and uh, they were particularly severe and particularly intense here the uh the commuter railroad from new york city was shut down um my husband was was stranded in manhattan for a while until they started running it again so and Peggy we, Clark, who was our guest last week, it seemed like it really hit her her area, which is just up the road from you. Yeah, Peggy lives about seven miles <laughs> to the west of me, so it's my area, it's her area. Um, you know, the the two tornadoes, there were at least two people killed when trees fell on cars. Um, an eleven year old in Newburgh, um, and um, a teacher at a local school. Uh, in uh, in Connecticut, and her her three year old child was in the car with her um, and survived. Um, so it's uh, you know there are people there are people hurting and digging out and fifty sixty thousand people still without power. But uh, you know I I rem I'm reminded that there are crews everywhere restoring that power here because we're in suburban New York. And the fifty or sixty thousand people without power are um, fairly affluent, mostly white suburban New Yorkers, um, and uh, there are more crews restoring those fifty or sixty thousand people's power than there are restoring power in Puerto Rico. Um, what is it now? Ten months after uh, the hurricane hit there, so you know it. it it's it's terrible tornadoes storms trees falling down and it's also a reminder of the privilege that we have here um so i try and hold those things they're both true right yeah i'm glad you're safe and your daughter turned five didn't i read that she turns, she turns five in june uh at the beginning of general assembly because those of you That's who were that's right. Friends of mine uh, at the General Assembly in Louisville remember that I um, I left GA just as it was starting to get to her birth, um, dropping all of the balls that I had, uh, <laughs> all the all the responsibilities I had for the UUA board at the time. I dropped on other people and and hopped on a plane to Tampa, Florida. So yeah, so her birthday will always be around GA. There you go. That's amazing. She might one day celebrate with her youth friends there. Oh. 
Let us hope. Let us hope. Christina well, might one day be really angry that I leave for GA on her birthday every year. <laughs> no, I often spend um, actually the Louisville GA. I spent my birthday driving to GA with a van load of youth, of you youth, youth um, which I can't think of a, a better way to spend my, my birthday. It's just fantastic. They always you youth always just give me all sorts of life uh, so I can I can say actually having a, a birthday at GA is a lot of fun uh, it's a great place to to celebrate with with folks so um, in Charlottesville we just had our one year um, commemoration of the first Tiki Torch rally of uh, white supremacist nationalists it was just on Sunday and um, a group of local activists got together and um, went to Emancipation Park to hold space and um, remember the beginning of, um, of last year's uh, summer, really, of, of events here in Charlottesville. And we're actively, um, you know, the community is trying to actively put together plans for what's gonna happen this summer um, to try and, and hold space and, and also remember that, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of the narrative is that we were invaded, that people came in and, uh, to remember that that, while some of that is true, that's not the, the full fullness of the truth, um, that a lot of those folks that we saw were, were from our area. We didn't, we didn't need to import, um, folks, um, that that is a very real um, experience of our everyday life as people of color in um, in this area. So, um, you know, a little bit of trepidation as to as to what this is going to hold uh, in the next few months here. Yeah, yeah. Oh. And, and I think that I think that you know the comment. Um, you know about immigrants as animals is is not um, it it strikes me as as very timely in terms of what's happening in Palestine and and timely in terms of what's happening going into the summer of um, you know knowing what happened last year um, and it's not the first time he said it you know so that's that's also the other thing that that. You know, I, I ask people to remember is this, this isn't anything new. Um, we are experiencing this because people are uncomfortable and he is the epitome of, um, of that white fragility uh, of white supremacy under attack. So um, it's, it's horrible that he said it, um, but I, I really urge folks to keep their eye on the ball. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I try to ignore a lot of what he says. I think, yeah. Well, and there are a lot of people not ignoring what he says, though. And, you know, the news here in New York the last two days has been about this this guy in a restaurant who it turns out is a, is a lawyer in New York City who started screaming at these two women for speaking Spanish to each other. Um, and, you know, get back to your own country. These were not that it matters, but these were two women who were born and raised in New York City. So, like, they have, <laughs> you know, their country, they were in it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just the way people are treating one another. I, I hear tell that there's a mariachi band rally happening at this man's um, office this afternoon, though. So. And, and he's a known, he is a known agitator. Right. So somebody who has gone after Linda Sassour, um, you know, this is not um, his first first time at the rodeo. Um, and, and you know, what, what Trump said, he was, where he said it was bringing together people to challenge the sanctuary um, laws in California, sanctuary city laws in California. And so I think what gets lost in this rhetoric of, you know, what he said, which again, horrible, is the actual manifestation of white supremacy that he's trying to, and oppressive policies that he's trying to, he and his administration are trying to enact. 
And so we focus on, you know, this horrible thing that he said. He, he was actually there because there's the Justice Department is suing California over its sanctuary city um, status. So that, you know, to me is is where our, our attention and, and resistance needs to be focused. I mean, we know he's an ass. Um, so, you know, that those are the, the, the two different. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Mm. Uh, I also want to lift up all across the country. Unitarian Universalists have been involved with the Poor People's Campaign, which launched on Monday. Uh, I know here in Twin Cities, 13 people were arrested and um, uh, more, is, more is going to be happening. And so, um, you know, I'm grateful for the people who res are resisting in that way. And uh, there's a lot of UU leadership, a lot of UU clergy who are out there. And so I just want to voice appreciation for that. Well, uh, Jess, anything you want to say from behind 15 screens about what's going on out West? No, no, we have the poor people's campaign in Olympia and Washington here. And uh, the folks tried to get arrested and failed. They would not arrest them. So it's a kind of West Coast classic moment. Um, but also a privileged moment. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I read Cecilia Kingman posted that she heard a cop saying, well, I don't want to arrest all these, all these not white people, old people will look bad. They were old white people though. But uh, Allison Miller told me she was arrested in New Jersey and that her handcuffs were put, metal handcuffs were put on really tightly and the older clergy woman next to her got very plastic, very loose, handcuffs and was told, you know, because you're, you're older. Now, as an older person, I don't mind the idea of not being, I'm, I'm nervous physically about arrest, which I am intending to do, but um, because, because I have some physical things by now, but um, it is interesting. And Al, what Allison said was, I'm so acutely aware of how well we were treated compared to people of color who are arrested. And um, that, is certainly undeniable. So anyway, so I think this is a lot about privileged people stepping out and hopefully disrupting business as usual. And we'll see. I, I feel like anything people can do to resist, I'm for it. So Julie Taylor, I'm excited to invite. Um, Julie is somebody a lot of us know through the trauma ministry, which um, Julie is one of the founder, well, I don't know the founders, but but no, not no, one of the founders, not but founder. very active and 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 has been a leader in that for some time. And um, and anyway, Julie and I were talking. It turned out Julie wrote 10 years ago a thesis about forgiveness. And I, I feel like forgiveness is just such an important topic for all of us for so many reasons, every single day, at least for me, I need it daily for things that I um, don't do well or, or wish I did better. And, um, and I feel like as you use, we really don't have rituals of forgiveness the way that some other faiths do. And so I was really excited to have a conversation. So Julie, let's start with what, what was it about this topic that called you to spend a year with it? Well, now we, you are going back 10 years to remember the state of mind uh, back then. I, I would say that I, it started for me at, at seminary, and this is my master's thesis that I wrote uh, on, on forgiveness. And actually the, the title of it is The Role of Aggression in Forgiveness, Cycles of Energy. And so that's, how, th that's what I was looking at is how aggression has a part of forgiveness. Uh, my my uh, concentration at seminary was in the psych and religion department. And so working with uh, Ann Ulanov at Union Theological Seminary is where I was and what I was interested in and spent the beginning part, the actually first semester, I think I took uh, a seminar class with Dr. Ulanov on aggression. And that's what got me thinking about it uh, on aggression itself as not necessarily just being negative and being about destruction. And so that class is what uh, started me just thinking about aggression, where, where it was it was sh a shift, uh, a shift in my thinking around it, taking the 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 tack uh, that aggression, uh, if you think about it in an, in its adjective form, is defined as marked by 
driving forceful energy or initiative. So really looking at aggression as energy and aggression then can be, is, it could be a tool as energy. It could be a tool and all tools can be used to build something or a tool can be used to tear something down. And that's not about the tool itself. It's about the, uh, not even just the intent. Uh, it could be about the intent. It can be about the skill in which the person utilizing it can, you know, can, can use a tool uh, and it can be the, the effect of it. So thinking about aggression as energy and then that energy, how can that be utilized and how is it utilized? How is it misused? Uh, how is it not paid attention to? And then how is it also judged? Where's value around that when we think of aggression? So I've been thinking about that over the course of, of my years at seminary. And when it came uh, to a thesis, I was also... Uh, I don't remember at the time necessarily what was happening, but kind of put together this idea of, of forgiveness and what it takes to forgive and also what it takes to be forgiven. And there's two sides uh, to those pieces. And in really doing more research and doing a lot of thinking about it and talking, uh, interviewing some folks for my, my thesis, uh, really came to look at and believe that in order to forgive, it's a process. It's an active process. It's not just a statement to actually forgive. It takes a lot of energy, a lot of energy. And I uh, used uh, pieces and, and uh, philosophies and, and kind of a, a lens of aggressive energy to forgive, but also it takes energy to be forgiven. And uh, so that's what I was looking at. And that's what I continue to think about. And so I was, I was grateful for your your offer to, to revisit this and to think about it a little bit more uh, at this time. It's something that I also have to work with on a daily basis when I'm conscious. Uh, I, think, I think considering forgiveness uh, and energy around both sides of that can be a spiritual practice in and of itself. And I'm, uh, I'm always trying to be more mindful. Uh, so this is a great opportunity for me to kind of jump back in and and talk about it. So I'm, I'm grateful for the ask. Well, well, say more about what what energy it takes to be forgiven. That's something I've never thought about. So uh, I think to to be forgiven, if you're a transgressor or a perpetrator of some act that uh, that's caused harm, the first thing that's going to take energy is to recognize and admit some kind of fault. And that takes energy to do it because, you know, you, that's not necessarily something that's required or something that you have to do. In fact, a lot of people don't take responsibility. So that in and of itself takes energy. It takes mental energy. It can take uh, emotional energy. Sometimes it takes physical energy to be able to muster uh, the strength to even admit uh, that you've done something wrong. So right there, Let's just start off with the beginning stages of what it would take to be forgiven. Um, I, uh, so I've, I've two, I've got two young kids. Uh, in fact, we're going through birthday week right now for the older one, uh, whose birthday was last week, but the party is Saturday. So it's an extended and, uh, and he just turned six. And then we've also got a three-year-old and we watch a lot of, uh, Daniel Tiger's neighborhood. Uh, for those of you that have little ones <laughs> know Daniel Tiger's neighborhood, and I think about, uh, I, you know, for all the things that it is uh, in terms of being for younger kids, there's some pieces in there. So there's a song that uh, gets sung on that show. And I don't know that I'll actually sing it for you. Maybe I'll just tell you the. the Michael might sing it, it looks like. <laughs> You're ready to sing it? I bet you know the, which one it is. And it's, and it goes, uh, saying I'm sorry is the first step. Then how can I help? So when, when you've done something wrong, Saying I'm sorry is, is a piece of it, but an apology is not the same as an amends and it's not the same as seeking forgiveness. And so there's energy just even in that process because it's a process. And when you look at literature around forgiveness, uh, biblical literature, I'd have to go back into my thesis to find some of those, I don't have that up, but you know, even within the Bible, within uh, psychological literature, within other kind of spiritual takes, it's an active process. It's not a passive process. And so being forgiven, there's a readying yourself because there's a humbling that's going to be required. There's an acknowledgement. Uh, there's an active process that saying I'm sorry is part of it. It's, uh, and then as far as Daniel, you know, with Daniel Tiger, how can I help being the next step? How can I repair what has 
been done and what I have done is going to take some action. So all those pieces, if you look at aggression as energy, as active energy, it's going to take active aggression in terms of energy to be forgiven. And I think also another piece of this as well is how do you, how do you stay forgiven in an idea of how, how do I continue a different behavior that will allow me to remain in a state of being forgiven for that transgression? You know, cause it's a thing you can say it. I, listen, I, like I said, I got a three-year-old and a six-year-old where the words, cause we're training them to say, I'm sorry. And the words are there. And then the same action happens 10 minutes later. Right. And that's part of a developmental stages that they're in. So it's, it's. Yeah. Cause we adults never do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> some of us don't get past certain developmental stages either. <laughs> uh, well, so there's a, there's a piece that you have to maintain energy to, uh, to have change. And if we really want to amend our behavior and change our behavior to, to stay in that place of forgiveness, uh, it, it takes a lot of action. It takes a lot of action. Huh. It's, uh, it's an interesting way to think about it with aggression, energy. I'm like, yeah, but aggression, you're saying that the energy has to break through some inertia or it, it's not just I have energy I'm sitting here it needs to be a, a forceful kind of energy is what you're saying I think so I think that that's that's the that's the piece it has to be intentional uh and it has to be I mean if you look at the bigger like psychoanalytic pieces of it, it it's there's cycles of construction and destruction and construction again and so we're looking at at the, uh, that energy, that aggressive energy is cons to be constructive, to build something, particularly after something has been broken or been destroyed. Uh, and so that, that does take more than just hanging out and having the, you know, the bare minimum of a, of a life, you know, of a pulse. It's more than just having a pulse. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, oh, go ahead, Michael. I'm hearing also that it's, it's not only active energy, but uh, the way you're describing this, it's also relational energy that's required. Um, you know, Daniel Tiger, and I am familiar and can sing it if you need me to. Um, you know, the how can I help piece of it, uh, how can I make reparations uh, for, for what I did, uh, opens one up to the possibility that the answer is you can't. Right, it, it's 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 a it's a vulnerability piece. Sometimes, sometimes, maybe, you know, the answer is you need to go away. <laughs> like I I need to I need to not be around you uh, for a while in order to to get past you know whatever it is you did. Um, so there's there's a relational and a vulnerability uh, piece to it that I'm also hearing in what you're saying too. Am I getting that right? Yeah, I would say that's on track. And I think because, uh, yeah, I, I do think that there, when we're looking at people involved and beings involved, so there's relation pieces that are involved and relationships. And uh, it's possible that, that I would say, though, if, if someone says, listen, um, how can I help? You can't help. It's dangerous for me to be in the room with you. It's dangerous for me to be present for this. So no. There are still ways as someone who is a transgressor or who has done something, um, how can I help may not be direct with that individual or that community, but there are things that I can do if I'm going to change to not do that kind of, of act, action and activity again. I think that there is still room for that, that aggression, that energy to say, if I'm committed to this, then that has to be also independent of of, uh, of someone I've, I've, I've hurt or, or injured. Um, it, it can be independent of a direct relationship because it also is about my relationship with myself. Uh, I've one of the, the, the two people, and again, I don't want to go down too many rabbit holes around this, but uh, the two people that I interviewed for my, my master's thesis happened to have both been incarcerated uh, for uh, sex uh, offenses with minors. And uh, one of the, one of the questions that came up for both of them that I had was, uh, how do you, do you feel like you could ever be, are you ever going to be forgiven? Can you be forgiven? Should you be forgiven? Particularly with uh, culturally, 
I don't know. It seems like uh, sexual offenses with certainly with minors is an unforgivable uh, offense in that the uh, once you're on a registry and once you have that that moniker, that does not go away regardless of whether you've served your time or not. Unlike other offenses where we say, hey, this is the rest, this restitution has happened and sometimes we consider it in the justice or injustice system that just spending time in prison, okay, you've done your time. So you get out a uh, clean slate, quote unquote, not for sex offenders often. And so if you can never be forgiven, how are you, how do you survive this? And one of the things that they had to talk about was, well, sometimes I have to look at at how do I at least forgive myself and have active energy that's around me forgiving myself, which is not the same as being forgiven by another person, so that I can go on and see if I can do, uh, and see if I can have other productive, uh, productive, creative place within whatever context I'm going to be in. It's complicated, and it's not it's not necessarily clean, even if it's. Uh, even if it happens well, doesn't mean that it's pretty or clean or wrapped up. You know, we've all, well, at least I can still remember being a kid where the aggression of asking for forgiveness came from the parent of a kid who had socked me or something, you know? And so the parent would drag the kid over and the kid would go, I'm sorry. And I would want to hit them because I knew they didn't believe it. And the, all the energy was the, held by the parent. So I'm wondering, Julie, um, that being probably my example of the worst kind of apology that could ever be, be made, what's actually an effective way to ask for forgiveness from someone? So there's, there's some steps to it. And I think forgiveness is even past the, is after the apology. Uh, part of it for me, the worst is not that one. And I, Having, having felt that way with my kids too, uh, having been like, some of that's modeling of what we expect too. So it's not that you can't do it. It's just, all right, they're not, they're not there yet. Uh, for me, some of the worst non-apologies are anything that starts, if you've been offended, right, which is not an apology, uh, especially when a lot of things, a lot of times when you hear that, well, I'm sorry if I offended anyone is uh, the, one, of the, one of the layers to that is often it's not about offense. You've actually hurt somebody. You haven't offended. You've actually hurt and done damage. And so that right there doesn't even admit any, and there's no acknowledgement of, of that kind of wrongdoing. So I want to lift up and I'm going to put it up on the screen here uh, and I'll share it. So uh, we have here uh, uh, an explanation or a, a, it's called here keys, six keys to a real apology. And this comes from uh, Leslie Mack and, and Drew from the interracial John. So if you can see this and you can, you can find this uh, on their website or through their Twitter feed, uh, this is really great. They actually do segments pretty regularly on their show about uh, where they rate apologies, the public apologies that have happened in the, in the world. And this is the, this is the criteria that they use. Uh, so six keys to a real apology. So the beginning with number one, uh, apologize in terms of, does the apology contain an expression of regret? Is there any kind of an expression of regret? And for me right there, if you do, uh, I, I'm sorry if I offended you, doesn't actually show any regret because there's not an admission. And we go here, any kind of an explanation of what wrong there's, that has to be part of this as well. Do you actually realize what happened? Which is different than, I'm sorry. Well, what are you sorry for? I don't know, but I know that I'm just supposed to be sorry for something. Okay. Well, we've started that, but what's the next pieces? So what, what actually went wrong? And some of that I think is important from, uh, if you're going to actually apologize is if I need to apologize for something that I've done, I should talk about what went wrong in my understanding, because I also may have missed where the, where some of the harm is. So by explaining from what my understanding of what went wrong. If, if the individual that I'm apologizing to says, okay, that's part of it, but it's not all of it. There, there we've got an open, an, an open op opportunity to, to explore it a little more deeply. Uh, then number three here uh, on the keys to a real apology is acknowledgement of responsibility. I did this. I did this. 
It may not have been my intent. It may not have been what I meant to, but regardless of all of that, this is what happened. I am responsible for these words or this action or uh, this participation. Moving into number four then, where's a declaration of repentance? How does that play in? Um, and then we get to kind of this Daniel Tiger piece, number five, an offer of repair. How can I help? What can I do? Is there something I can do? Again, I, I think to your point earlier, there are times when, when direct repair may not be possible. It also may not be safe. It may not be warranted, but there may be a way. How can some kind of repairing damage uh, go on, or at least an offer of that? And then a request for forgiveness, which comes after, you know, towards the end of this, uh, a request of forgiveness. Will you forgive me? I'd like to ask for forgiveness. And that being done without an expectation that it be given. And certainly not an expectation that it be given right away. So this is a, this is a framework to, to start the process of where forgiveness might be able to come in. Uh, I think really starts with this kind of an apology. And, you know, this, using this framework, this can be done individual to individual. This could be done uh, organizationally when, when things happen that organizations uh, need to, to apologize for and seek forgiveness for. So uh, I, I offer this up as a, as a, beginning, as a beginning place and a really nice, uh, succinct visual, too, uh, from the interracial John from Leslie and Drew. It's great. It's really helpful. And I, I like, I haven't listened to that. So they, they rank public apologies. I bet you learn a lot listening to that part too, because we hear a lot of non-apologies. It's true. Huh. What do you think, um, you know, my Jewish friends know that when Yom Kippur comes, it's a time of atonement. And, and one of the things that they've said to me is that a Jewish sense of forgiveness and atonement, it's very different from a Christian when it's not turn the other cheek. It is about, okay, wait, how's this gonna actually change? You know, and then without a commitment to actual change, you don't owe anybody to forgive them. You know, whereas I think in Christianity, it's kind of like, you're just supposed to be forgiving because you're Christian. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of curious where Unitarian Universalism comes into, that's just two, two very, broad generalizations of, of, of faith understandings, but how do you see Unitarian Universalists dealing with this in any kind of consistent or structural way? Well, I look forward to hearing from other people on the panel about this too, because I in no way am an expert in Unitarian Universalism uh, around, around big, big pieces along these lines. But I, I would agree that we, we don't necessarily, we don't certainly don't have anything like Yom Kippur, right? We don't have any pieces like that. But I, I wonder about even just a ritual of asking forgiveness after apologies. If that's something that that's something that I don't see happen a lot in general. I see apologies, but that next step of asking forgiveness is a piece that um, that I don't that I, I know I have not experienced often. And, uh, and, I, rec and I, I try to stay on top of myself when I, uh, when I owe something in terms of an apology, when I, uh, when I have done damage, when I have made mistakes, I try to be fairly proactive about that. And one thing I, I personally, and this is not, I'm not gonna universalize this, I'm gonna say for me, I haven't noticed that that second part of if I ask forgiveness, I don't know that a lot of people know what to do with that. And so that ritual uh, that I grew up with, um, that was certainly something, I mean, I'm, I'm pushing 50 at this point. So that was definitely something, and I don't know if that's a, just a cultural shift, but a ritual to apologizing, asking, for, asking forgiveness, and then potentially maybe being granted forgiveness, that exchange that dynamic of energy exchange is, is something that if we're not doing it, I think that we could benefit from. This is like the um, fourth and fifth step, like of the 12 steps. It reminds me of that process. And having done that personally, the, the process can you, of- Can you say what those two steps are, Jess? 
Um, the fourth is making a list of all the people we had harmed and willing, being willing to make amends. And then the fifth step is actually going and making amends wherever possible. And um, the process of making amends, I mean, the writing the list is hard enough, but then the process of making the amends is so, uh, I think a lot of times it's more challenging to the person or my experience was when I went to apologize and like seek forgiveness from people, it was so hard for them, like so hard for them. And um, what was hard? Was it hard for them to acknowledge what yeah, happened? Or? Yes. That, that, you know, hard for them to acknowledge that they had been hurt by me even, you know, I think um, hard for people to be vulnerable in offering forgiveness. Um I mean, all of that, you know, all of that. Um, I mean, when people can come together and, and have that moment and that ritual of, you know, seeking forgiveness and, and, and offering it, it's beautiful, but um, man, it's so hard. Just a, so uh, ninth step is the actual going to, just to get all those pieces in there. <laughs> Good, thank you. Well, there's just, <laughs> it's been a while. I was going to bring up the twelve step pieces too because I think there is ritual in that in in ways that 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 for people that are involved in twelve step programs that there is there are some concrete steps to that and that fourth step is the first thing make a list what have I done so there's an acknowledgement as part of that there is an acknowledgement to myself and then and then you do. Uh, uh, admit to the fifth step is that admit to God, to ourselves and another human being. So there's a list and then you don't just keep it yourself and you don't even just keep it between you and a higher power. You actually tell someone else, you tell kind of a, usually a neutral party to get that out. That takes aggressive energy because it's hard. It's hard. And then that ninth step is actually going to an individual and, and, seeing if there's a way, if it's, if it's something that's, but again, there's even caveats with that, as long as to do so would not injure them or injure other people. So that requires some discernment and some consideration. And it's not, then it's not just about me because it'll make me feel better to admit this thing uh, that you may not have known that I did to you. Uh, so I'll feel better to get it off my chest, but actually if it's going to hurt you, then guess what? Then I need to keep still sit with that. And I need to find ways to do right, regardless of whether you even know I did you wrong. That becomes really important. Um, and then looking, I think too, I mean, cause I'm glad you brought up the 12 steps cause it's a great place to look, to talk about this too. The 10th step is continue to take personal inventory. And when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. So that again is, is looking at how, how often regularly are you gonna pay attention to what, what you're doing and how you're affecting people and then take responsibility right now. And so that's a spiritual practice in and of itself. Uh, the 12 steps give us a, a good framework for that. And, and I think there is within Unitarian Universalism. I mean, um, if you look at, you know, um, John Luther, uh, James Luther Adams, my five smooth stones of um, liberal religion, you know, a lot of folks think that that, that, that is really talking about um, how social justice and working for justice is at the center of what we do. And, and that's absolutely true, but you can also read those as a way to live out our life. And so if you look at, you know, the fourth smooth stone is, um, we deny the, the immaculate conception of virtue that, that we actually have to work at it in, in bringing it into the world. And, so it's not just enough to be a good person, you know, quote unquote, be a good person. It's actually acknowledging that this is something that we have to work on and that we have to actually do and practice um, in our lives. And so, you know, I think even within Unitarian Universalism, there are elements of our UU theology that we've um, really kind of categorized around different um different things that we do that that actually have much broader um, frameworks for how we live our lives. And, and that's something that I think 
um, that we've lost a little bit as we've moved away from Unitarian and Universalism being a Protestant religion um, into, into the religion and faith that we know it today. I think there's still some things in there that we could really go back and say, yeah, there, there are some um, defining values of how we go out and live our lives, including um, you know, how do we ask for forgiveness and, um, and how do we, we give forgiveness um, that, that really do speak to us as Unitarian Universalists. And the words that I always remember are living amends, that um, so many of the ways that I choose to live my life are me making amends for things that, you know, I can't necessarily ask for forgiveness from a particular person, but I can live my amends, you know, and, and I always think of this when we talk about environmentalism and how um, the little things that I do, even though who knows what sort of difference they make in, in the future of our planet or whatever is like a living amends, you know, to the earth or whatever, like those sorts of um, practices I think are important. I was thinking about who has approached me and asked for forgiveness. And it has generally either been someone in a 12 step program or a Jewish friend during Yom Kippur. I mean, and I, I can't really think of, I mean, certainly because I have so many friendships with Unitarian Universalists, there's a lot of give and take. I mean, Julie, I just like profusely apologize for something I did with you a few months ago, you know, and, and so that's just par for the course, right? That's just daily life as you screw up. I mean, you know, um, but that kind of ritualized sense of putting a shape around it, um, I would love more of that. You know, well, and I love Christine. I love to hear you reclaim JLA in that way. I mean, uh, you know, how how could we help each other to get better at this? I mean, if you remember too, you know, I remember that incident, and I also immediately wrote back, and actually, I think I even wrote in the email, "I forgive you," because I think about this and how uh, how to, that that's a hard that's a piece right there that often um, I've certainly written and said and apologized for things similarly to, to just a, you know, daily stuff. I'm, I'm sorry about that. And then I met with silence or often silence, not even a, Hey, it's okay. Don't sweat it. I get what was happening. That at least is a piece in there, but often there's just, it goes out into nothing and nothing's returned. And that's the part where then, uh, for me, at least, if that energy uh, of trying to rebuild, I'm trying to figure out, are we rebuilding? I don't know, because I don't know if I've been forgiven. And see, part of that, I think, also comes with, if you are being asked to forgive, if you choose to forgive someone, it's going to take energy to maintain yourself in that place of forgiving, because that also requires that you, that you uh, let go of resentment and bad feelings around it. And that's a piece that I'm where, that's where I start to wonder, so did, are you still resenting me over it? Because you didn't say you forgave me. So I don't know if we're okay or not. I don't know where we can rebuild. That's a complicated part of more of a ritual that's beyond just words that requires energy on both sides. Yeah, I'm in the middle of that with a good friend right now. I, I hadn't thought about it. I mean, I, I've been thinking a lot about it, but I hadn't thought about it in the context of this show. And it's exactly that. like. I made a mistake, you know, I said so immediately in the conversation, it was clear we weren't done. I emailed more, you know, looking at Drew and Leslie's more about what I saw that had happened to make sure I got it all. And that was two days ago and I've heard nothing. And, um, and so, like you say, I'm like, we're in a group together and I'm, I'm now like, you know, I think maybe I'm going to leave the group <laughs> and I don't know if I need to be thinking that, but because there's no response, I have no sense of the boundaries. Because it was a group she was in. She's an old friend. Why don't you come? It'll be great. I critiqued something about it. It upset her. It's her group. Okay, I, I get it. That hurt her. So, but um, so now I'm like, okay, I'm going to quit the group. I mean, you're kind of left on your own to figure out what to do to make amends if somebody doesn't say to you like. You know what, like I, even if she said to me, you know what, I wish you'd quit the group. That would be a huge relief to me rather than me having to figure out all of it. 
And, um, and that's an old relationship. With somebody with whom I have less of a relationship, they may very legitimately feel like, deal with it yourself, man. <laughs> you know, this is really, this is on you and whatever, you deal with it. And, and that's fair, you know, in some situations. Um, so, but yeah, I, I'm curious if any of our congregations actually have times of let's do this together this week. Let's go into our lives and, and do this together. Cause it would, I, it always feels powerful to me if, if a Jewish friend during Yom Kippur says, I was making a list and you're on it. And I realized whatever they realized, whether I actually was hurt by it or not. Often I'm like, okay, kind of like what, what Jessica said, it didn't actually, it went by whatever they did, but it still feels great that they were thinking about me and wanting our relationship to be good. Well, and I just want to also lift up that when I say that it's hard when you don't know if you haven't heard, that does not at all mean that I believe that because I ask for forgiveness that I should be granted it. So I don't want to conflate those two ideas either. Uh, so that be, this is more about intentional or is, is then granting forgiveness, is that something that we state or is that something that just gets assumed or it gets forgotten or we don't, we don't think about it and don't talk about it. And so that's why I'm kind of lifting it up intentionally because sometimes it's not stated. And so then how... Uh, not knowing how to move on and yet also recognizing that it's not expected. And it just because I ask for it doesn't mean that I, that I am going to be forgiven uh, because there's, I think there's some trust and communication and there has to be some kind of a, a, of pieces left to be able to build from if everything gets destroyed and you can't build from it again. So some things it's going to be harder to than others. And some things, you know, it's possible. Maybe some things shouldn't be forgiven. Well, and I have not been forgiven, you know, through during active addiction and then trying to make amends. And so that's part of the, what that living amends is where I'm like, well, I can only commit to learning from this. You know, I can only commit to, um, taking this forward and not doing this again to another person. And, you know, that's, that's it. That's interesting. Sorry, Michael, you go. I, I was going to say, it's interesting that Drew and Leslie were talking about this on their interracial yawn. Um, what do you think this has to do with, <laughs> there's a loaded question, but it seems to me that this is, uh, they'd say an improv, make a declaration. It seems to me that this process of right relationship and coming back is critical if we're to do the kind of anti-oppression work that we talk about wanting to do. And uh, Julie, you've been in the center of that work. I'm, I'm curious how you see this as part of this. I think on every level from individually, one-on-one -on -one, to systemically, to institutionally, big institutions, little institutions, all these, these are, these become incredibly important. White supremacy often just assumes that no apologies, repair or breach even has been made. And so that assumption uh, creates more damage. Uh, and so this, th there's no place that thinking about apologies, seeking forgiveness, uh, granting forgiveness, all those pieces, there's no place that, that there is not room for that. And that for, especially those of us that hold privilege, that we should not be recognizing on a regular basis where our energy needs to lie in terms of repairing the brokenness that we've caused. Well, and it's interesting, Meg, what I was gonna say, when we started talking at the same time um, was actually almost uh, was very similar um, and so make a declaration so I was thinking about how this relates to institutional work of um, you know and the ins specifically the institutional work that we're trying to do in Unitarian Universalism right now around white supremacy Right, so specifically that is what I was thinking about. And, and I think, you know, I as an individual can 
do the introspection and the assessment about the times that I as an individual perpetuated or supported white supremacy culture in Unitarian Universalism. Um, and I can seek forgiveness as an individual for that. Um, but how do we make the leap to institutions um, seeking to repair, right? To seeking to seeking for forgiveness, um, which, you know, or living amends, right? How does Unitarian Universalism live amends for the, for the white supremacy culture that we've instituted and perpetuated, you know, at, you know, uh, period. <laughs> Question mark, how do we do that? I wonder. And that's what I was wondering when, so... You know, I think that I think that you know what Julie's lifting up for us here, and, and certainly what um, Leslie and Drew as graphic talks about is you know there's such um, there's such a a thought around you know you ask for forgiveness, you're forgiven, and you move on. Um, that the repair portion, the repentance portion, the restoration portion is so frequently forgotten, um, you know, in our larger society, but certainly within Unitarian Universalism, you know, and as we're looking at dismantling white, white supremacy and, and, you know, truly making ourselves anti-racist, anti-oppressive, multicultural, is um, that repentance and repair um, it has to go hand in hand. Like you, you cannot have one without the other. And so often we have had some of the repentance and almost none of the repair. And I really think that that's, um, that's got to change. It just has to change. As I'm looking at the at the graphic, it's really important these kind of steps, the keys in terms of the order that request for forgiveness comes at the end of those other pieces. To just ask for forgiveness without admitting that you having regret, actually acknowledge that there's responsibility, declare that you do repent, that this is something, offer repair, only then do you get to request forgiveness. This idea of of forgive me so that we can move on is really cheap grace. If we're going to look at Bonhoeffer and if we're going to think about that from a Christian context, that's really looking for cheap grace. Uh, and that that's definitely not the kind of value system. That's not an ethical structure or a moral stance that I'm willing to live in is coming for cheap grace. It has uh, that's not where I'm going to go. And it's not the kind of Unitarian Universalism that I want to invest my time and energy in either. Uh, there's also in, in different literature and pieces that I've looked at as well, this idea around can groups forgive or can groups be forgiven is another big question. And I don't know that there's a definitive piece, but there's great writing about it. Um, you know, the, uh, the Sunflower, if you haven't read The Sunflower by uh, Simon uh, uh, Wiesenthal, that's a great book to start taking a look at. Uh, and uh, there's another one that's more of an academic book, but it's really accessible and easy. Uh, I've got it here, I'm looking at it, called Forgiveness and Revenge by uh, Trudy uh, Govier, where she really talks about group, that group piece. How do groups do this? Because it's more complicated when you put groups into the mix uh, because groups are not monolithic. And so that's, that's something that I think you have to be even more intentional about. And Unitarian Universalism uh, has a lot of responsibility um, in, in terms of, of white supremacy. The other thing I'll just say uh, real quick is, and this comes from Trudy Govier's book, this Forgiveness and Revenge book, the idea of forgiveness uh, is, is another layer, but reconciliation requires trust. And it goes beyond just, it, it goes beyond, again, just an apology or even asking forgiveness, a next step and then is reconciliation. And there must be trust on both sides that further harm will not be inflicted. Or if it is that we're going to be able to do more steps again and get here. And I don't know that there's a whole lot of trust 
for Unitarian Universalists or, or whiteness at all around white supremacy and our willingness to actually dismantle it and try to even do the beginning things before we can even ask for forgiveness. We're not even at that step, let alone reconciliation and let's make this all go away. Forget it. That's not even what reconciliation is, is make it go away. Uh, uh, one last thing I just want to mention around this because, uh, and that I think is important is that forgiveness doesn't make it go away. Forgiveness can fix brokenness that cannot be undone. It can help fix the brokenness, but it cannot make it not happen. But things that you can't undo, that's where forgiveness is at least an opportunity to, be, to have a possibility of repairing something that cannot be undone. So it's important. And yet it's not just words and that becomes key. Yeah, I will say I'm way more interested in the repairing part than the like the step five part than the step six part. I mean, if we get to step six, that's fantastic, right? But um, how does how does the institution do the repairing part? Um, is like we need to figure that out. Right? Well, has the institution done the earlier stuff? Because jumping right up to top steps, you tend to trip on the ones coming up, and that becomes a question too. Christina, you're muted. What would it look like to have our institutions and and when I say institutions, our congregations look at that from their past and not um, not shy away from it, you know, to take a look and see, you know, right now we have a crisis with religious professionals of color um, to have congregations look at their past and seeing the ways in which that they have injured religious professionals of color and what would um, repair look like. And I mean, to state the obvious, part of white fragility is never getting to step one, right? I mean, because you look at the reaction to just, and, and it crosses all the spectrums about just um, saying, you know, I've had people say to me, like, what do you care about slavery? You know, and it's like, to even tiptoe to step one, you get pushed back. So yeah, figuring out how we can really be grounded and move towards reparations. It's, uh, this has been a helpful beginning conversation and um, many more, but thanks Julie for the work. It, it, um, it's exciting. I feel like when we get to this level of conversation, it, you know, it feels like we're a religious community trying to do this and that feels really important. Anything you didn't say that you want to say, Julie, as we wrap up? This is why I added aggression to my thinking about this, because it takes energy to do it. It takes energy on all these sides and it takes active energy. It's not passive. This idea, right? like, you know, I'm going to forgive and open up my hands and let it go. That tends to be where we look and find or offer cheap grace. And that, that, that aggression piece, this takes energy. It takes commitment. It takes work. And so that's, that's why I think they're interwoven, at least for me, in the kind of forgiveness I want to offer, the kind of forgiveness I want to receive, and the kind of change that comes with, with that relational piece that I want to live out um, for all the times that I mess up in my transgressions, which are many and continued. Uh, skipping those steps, skipping the steps doesn't, doesn't do it. It doesn't do it for me spiritually. And so I think that's just what I want to offer. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here. Next week, we have Dr. Anthony Pinn coming to talk about UU humanism. That's one we've been uh, working on for a while. So I'm excited to, to have that conversation. I uh, hope everybody uh, stays strong and resilient and keep fighting. And I have one thing, if I may, Meg. Yeah, absolutely. Um, something I've known, but I'm excited that they just announced like two minutes ago. Um, so the 2018 Angus McLean Award winner for Religious Education Excellence is none other than Aisha Hauser. And so I so look forward oh, to- Oh, I'm so excited. I wish you were here so we could all freak out on her. <laughs> we should definitely freak out on her next week and many weeks after that. <laughs> that's fantastic. So well-deserved. Wow, that's great. Well, that, that leaves us with big smiles on our face here. See you next time.